Okay, so this session is about NVDINs. Uh, so, NVDINs are, it's a standard for allowing NVRAM, non-volatile RAM, to be exposed as normal memory. Um, so, and this has the potential to dramatically change the way in which we write software. For a long time we've had the fundamental assumption we're going to have RAM, which is fast, or we're going to have persistent storage, which is very slow. Um, uh, NVDINs have the, the potential to dramatically change the way we, which we write a lot of our software. However, they have a number of surprising issues to solve, uh, particularly with respect to Zen. And it's also the case that um, the specifications that are out there are often difficult to navigate and they have a lot of confusing terminology. Um, so I have spent a fair amount of time over the last few months digging through things, finding out what's actually going on. So my goal for this talk, um, I want to give you an overview of the uh, MBDM concepts, terminology, and architecture. One of the things I've discovered is that the, the documentation for MBDM is actually quite accurate and very complete, but it's, and it, the problem is that um, it's written for people who already know the big picture of how things are supposed to fit together. So part of my goal for this talk is to give you that big picture so that when you go to the documentation, you're not completely lost in the sea of, um, uh, of concepts. I'm going to introduce some of the issues they bring up with regard to operating systems, and, and Zen in particular, and then I'm going to talk about a sketch of some of the design solutions that we might have for Zen. Uh, and then later, today or tomorrow, there's going to be a design session about um, an MVDM, which we're going to talk about, kind of get into, dig into the details of uh, what to do that. So the current tech, so the MVDM specification has been around for a while, but the current technology, which you can actually buy in this instant, uh, looks like this. It's basically it's called MVDM in, which is basically it's just a normal DRAM chip with uh, flash backup. And the idea is that when the power cuts out, we have a capacitor that, that um, powers the controller just long enough to copy the memory from the DRAM into uh, a flash. And then when the power comes back on, you read the data out of the flash and put it back into the, into the DRAM. So obviously, in this case, this is not going to revolutionize the industry because any DIN is going to be strictly more expensive, any MVDIM like this is going to be strictly more expensive than an equivalent sized DRAM chip. However, uh, it should be the case so that coming soon, there's going to be new technologies for MVDIM which will allow terabytes or petabytes of MVDIMs uh, at a fairly reasonable price. And that has the potential to have a pretty big impact on how we do um, uh, web software. So let's start with some terminology. Uh, so first of all, we have physical DIMs. A DIM is a dual inline memory module, so the physical thing you can plug into your motherboard. Um, so here we have four DINs. Um, each DIN has within it uh, DIN physical addresses, so DPAs. So each DPA will have, you know, relative to that DIN address zero through however big it is. But of course, to be able to access that, you can't um, you can't uh, access those DPAs directly. You have to put them in a page tables, and page tables need system physical addresses. So there has to be a mapping from the DIN physical addresses to the system physical addresses so that you can actually put it in your page tables and write it. Now, the specification defines two different ways to uh, have this mapping. So the first type is called PMAP. PMAP is RAM-like access, okay? So you have a one-to-one -one mapping between the DIN physical addresses and the system physical addresses. And typically, we expect these mappings to be interleaved, right? So if you are, uh, going through your system physical address space um, uh, consecutively, then what will happen typically is maybe one cache line will be one DIM, the next cache line will be the next DIM, um, and so on, striped across the, the DIMs. So you can think about this, it's a bit like RAID 0 for disks, okay? So the advantage is that you get better performance. If you're reading consecutively through your address space, then you're keeping, um, you're striking the accesses across all the, the RAM, which makes things faster. However, uh, it gives you much worse reliability. Because if any one of those DIMs fails, then you basically lose all your data, unless somehow you can recover data from one every third cache line. The other way of mapping the uh, MVDIMs into 
this little space is called P block. And this is kind of more like a disk like access. So you have a control region and a, uh, a data window. And the idea is that the control region changes where in the uh, in the dim the data window points to. Okay, so it might start there. You poke the control region to there. You poke the control region goes up to there. Um, there's one control region window per physical dim, um, and it's never interleaved. Now you might ask, okay, if we have pmem way of accessing it, why on earth would you want this p block thing? Like, what's the point of it? Well, there's a couple points. Um, first is that it might be useful for something like software uh, RAID, right? So as we said, PMEM is a bit like RAID 0. If you want to have control over the, uh, the rep replication um, speed uh, aspect, you might want to be able to use um, P block. The other is that it would be useful in the cases where the system physical address space is less than the amount of entity RAM size, right? So for four level paging, the, the paging thing itself, architecture, only has 48 bits, which will give you 256 terabytes of address space. If you have a petabyte of data, um, petabyte of MVDN, you're not going to be able to even map it to PMAP. Uh, but with PBlock, you're able to do that. Right. So the next question is, how is mapping set up? Uh, the mapping will be set up by the firmware when you boot. Um, you may be able to modify the mapping, say the number of interleaf sets or things like that, via BIOS or by uh, a uh, vendor specific tool. Um, but in general, the, the expectation seems to be that the operating system is not going to have any direct involvement in that. After it boots up and sets up the mapping um, from the NGDIMS into the SPA region, it will expose that information via ACPI. The data exposed in ACPI is um, going to be in two, in two places. Now, and part of the reason I'm talking about this is just to, because the the terminology is slightly confusing, uh, so I want to make it so that when you read the specification, you already know kind of uh, what things are, um, how things are working. So, uh, you typically have one MVM root device per system, and that's just kind of the MVM controller. And under the MVM root device, you will have something called an MVM device. Uh, one MVM device is one physical thing. Okay. Uh, so you'll have one, one MVM device in your ACPI thing for a DIM, which will have information about the size, about the manufacturer, and all kinds of other information. The other class of information is about the mapping. So the, the, the information about the mappings of how you actually access it are in something called the NFIT table, which is the MVM firmware interface table. Okay, it has information about the PMEM access, which will be SPA ranges for the PMEM and the interleaf uh, sets. And it has um, information about P-block, so where the control regions are and where the data regions are now. There's a couple practical um, questions to, to discuss about how an operating system in general will use MVNs. So much like disks, if you have a really large disk, you want to be able to partition, partition it up. You want to be able to have some parts of it that are used for one thing, some parts that are used for another thing. You also may want to share the disk between operating systems. Right. So on a typical system, you might have, um, probably a lot of you on your laptops, you might have a Linux swap partition, a Linux, uh, a couple of the Linux um, other partitions, and maybe a Windows partition. Okay. And the way that you do this on um, a disk is a, is a partition table. Um, so you, you may want to do the same thing for um, MVDINs. You also need to know how to access each thing. So um, it's the specifications have the concept the expectation that some memory controllers will allow you to access the same RAM, that same MVDIM, um, either via PMEM or via PBLOCK. But it's obvious that like, if, you're, um, if your PMEM is striped across <coughs> several DINs, accessing it via PMEM will give you a very different result than accessing the same data via PBLOCK. So you need to know before you access it how you, whether it should be accessed via PMEM or whether it should be accessed via PBLOCK. Uh, you also need to detect when the interleaving has changed. So one of the things the specification expects is that uh, you may have a situation where you know you have a system set up with two DIMs, and then you add two more DIMs and reboot, and now you have a four-way interleave set. So you, operating system needs to be, to be able to detect that the interleave set has changed. So to do this, um, the specification defines something called namespace. Now, this is a particular example where the name, uh, the, lab the, the term that they 
developed uh, doesn't actually make much sense because it's not a name space. Like, think of a C++ name space, it's not like that at all. It's just a chunk of data. Okay, so when you see your namespaces, think partitions. So for PMEM namespaces, if you remember, um, you're going to have interleaved across several DINs. So a single PMEM namespace will be striped, be, have chunks of things across four different DINs, right? So here we have the blue, one blue namespace and one uh, green name, namespace that describe different chunks of the array DINs. Um, P block namespaces, on the other hand, um, are contiguous. They can only have a, a P block namespace can only be in one DIN at a time. Uh, so you could say, well, here's one P block namespace, here's another P block namespace. One of the differences about P block namespaces is they can actually be made up of several chunks, right? So in this case, we have a single yellow, yellow namespace is uh, striped across these two different chunks. Okay. And um, namespaces can have a UUID. Okay, so just like you partitions, you can have a label that says this is a Linux swap, this is Linux X, this is NTFS4. You can have a type UUID um, to define how, what the data, what to expect from the data inside of that. Um, namespace. So the next question is, okay, how do we store, where do we store the namespace information? So reading and writing P block, if you read and write for P members of P block, you're going to get different results. Um, and you may also get different results if you change the PMEM interleaving set after reboot. Um, so we can't store, we can't store the partition table stuff inside the images itself. This isn't, isn't quite going to work. So the solution they came up with was something called the labeled area. So this is a separate storage area um, per MVDIN. So each MVDIN will have a separate, what's called a label area, where you can um, store data. Um, a label is a single, a single contiguous region on a single DIN, right? So here, in this case, um, on, on the, the DIN on the right, we have, you know, uh, uh, the mauve names, the mauve bit, the green, red, blue, and we have a mauve, green, red, and blue label, um, and so on, corresponding to the different regions on the things. And a namespace is made up of several labels. Okay, so in this case, we have a single green namespace, which is made up with four different labels in the, uh, the different label areas, and the yellow namespace is made up of the two different labels on the um, uh, on, on that little area. Uh, and <clears throat> the label areas are accessed via ACPI AML methods. Um, this may seem super detailed, but there's actually a reason I'm bringing this up. Really <coughs> okay. So um, the AML methods are pure read-write. Okay. So any operating system can simply read or write the, um, the AML data. And it is not interpreted by the hardware or by the firmware in any way. So in theory, just like a partition table, you don't have to have a partition table on your disk. You can just ban write stuff to it. Uh, in the same way, you can write, in theory, you can write whatever you want in here. Okay, you can hide your secrets or your secret keys or whatever in here if you want to, and that will have no effect on the system. But what a useful thing to do, just like on most disks, the standard thing to do is you have a partition table for most um, and be then, the standard thing to do will be to use this as a label area. Okay, so. Putting that all together, how does an operating system determine how to access the namespaces? So the first thing you have to do is to read the ACPI infant table, and determine how many DIPs you have, then determine um, where in the system physical address space the PNM is mapped. Um, it has to use the ACPI AMM methods to read the label areas. It has to piece together the labels into namespaces. Uh, then we have to double check to make sure that the interleave sets written in the label areas are the same as the interleave sets we got from ACPI. Otherwise, we may need to just write a completely new set of label areas. Um, and then, finally, we can access the PMEM labels via the SPA regions and access the PBLOCK uh, regions by controlling the, the data window um, into the, into the MVDMs. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Um, take a short break. It's a beautiful scenery. Um, <laughs> okay, so if you didn't understand much of that, okay, here, 
I got five minutes left. Here are the key points. Um, namespace is a bit like a partition. A label area is a bit like a partition table. Um, uh, yes. Okay, since I only had five minutes, sorry, did you say ten minutes or five? Ten minutes. Oh, ten. Great, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, label areas are accessed via ACBI AML methods. Okay, so briefly we'll discuss how MVDMs are um, done on Linux. There's a tool called MD Control, which will create and destroy namespaces. There are four different types of namespace you can create. Um, one is, so you can have a raw mode, sector mode, FS dash, or dev dash. Um, and I have a bit more information. I don't have time to go into detail about the difference between these different things. Um, I have a slide for each of these things to describe a bit more into it, so it will be posted eventually on the website, and you can um, take a look at it to, to get a bit more of an introduction. So the ideal namespace, so when you think about, okay, persistent memory, the obvious thing that you want to be able to do is to say, I have a, I have a program, I'm gonna map a file, um, and map a file, and when I write and read, read and write that file, it's going to magically stay the same. Okay. The obvious solution that you might want to do is to say, okay, I'm going to take a namespace, I'm going to make it to a block device. I'm going to put a normal partition table in the namespace, I'm going to put a file system inside the partition table, and they're going to make it such that when I mmap files, then that writes, the mapping ends up writing and reading directly to onto the PMAP. Actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, uh, so, the, the, one of the, so one of the key things is that um, Linux, in order to map something <coughs> into a user space process, it needs to have a page struct. It needs to keep track of, it needs information about what the mapping is like, it needs to have reference counts and things like that. Okay? Um, the Linux page struct is 64 bytes per 4 kilobytes. Um, which means that if you have one terabyte of PMAP, it takes almost 8 gigabytes of page structs. Which means, obviously, once we start having, say, if you had four, uh, say, four terabytes of your PMAP, that's 32 gigabytes of um, RAM that it, that, that it might take up. So it's just not very practical with these large sizes of PMAP to keep that in what's called system memory in your normal RAM. Okay. So the solution is to use the PMAP itself to store um, a page struct. And now, the way that Linux does that is that when it creates a namespace, it, will, it has some specific namespace types, the UIDs, that say this has a superblock at the beginning. In the superblock, um, it says, it is, when you create the namespace, it writes the superblock and pre-allocates specific parts of the namespace to be used by Linux for, as scratch space, basically, for the, um, the page tables. Um, and so there, uh, there's no actual long-term storage there, it's just many, meant to be used as scratch space by uh, Linux. There's a bunch of other issues I want to get into now about um, how file systems want to be able to move blocks around to consolidate things. Well, that causes problems if you have um, MF. Um, there's also strange interactions with the page cache, uh, which means that basically um, all the different modes that we, we mentioned, so raw, sector, FS DAX, and dev DAX, have advantages and disadvantages, but there's not one clear winner yet. Um, and so it seems to me, um, in general, that we haven't actually quite figured out, as Linux um, has quite figured out, the best way to expose PMAP to um, uh, the guests. So that is still going to be evolving a bit. Okay. So let's talk about Zen. Um, now there's two general areas we need to talk about when we're talking about Zen. First of all is how Zen interacts with DOM0 and the physical enemy dance. The other is how Zen will expose virtual MVDMs to the guest. Okay. So the first issue we run up against is that Zen cannot read or cannot um, issue AML calls. Okay. So to read the label area, you have to issue AML calls, and Zen can't do AML. So the, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is that uh, the AML. Okay. So the main thing is that the ACPI spec requires a single entity to actually do the AML. And DOM0 needs to do, be able to do that, to issue AML calls in order for, to be able to properly do the devices. Which means if DOM0 is doing it, Zen can't do it. Um, so Zen is not able to uh, read and write the label area. The next issue is, just like Linux, Zen needs page trucks. To, so to be able to safely expose RAM-like things to guests, 
it needs to be able to do reference counting. For reference counting, there's a page drop, and um, which means it needs it's not 64 bytes per 4K page, but it is between 30 or 40 bytes. Uh, sorry, 32 or 40 bytes. The final issue, uh, the big issue we have to come up um, deal with, is this thing of RAM versus MMIO. Okay, so DOM zero can map any address, physical address that um, is, is in the address space. Okay, but when it's mapping MIO, there's no reference counting. When it's mapping RAM, something that has a page struct, then there's reference counts that have that are, that are taken every time you put something into the DOM zero page table. So if we change something from being not reference counted to being reference counted, while DOM0 has references in its page tables, then those reference counts will be wrong. Okay, so we need to deal somehow with, with, with having um, uh, with, with, with this issue. So there's two, two kind of basic options. The first is tell DOM0, okay, before you promote PMEMS from NYO to being reference counted. You have to unmap it all, make the hypercolder promote it, and then map it all again. The other option is to have Zen go through and um, find all of DOM zero's references and make a reference count for all of the references so that, so that it's, it's accurate. If we just tell DOM zero, all right, you have to unmap it and then map it again, we kind of have two options. The option one is we just trust DOM zero to do the right thing. Um, well, that seems a bit unsafe. The other option is to track to make sure that DOM0, so if DOM0 says promote these pages and then looks to see if it has any references, if so, then it refuses. Um, now, this is actually a very tricky problem that we're still kind of talking through, so hopefully we can do some more hashing out the design session um, today or tomorrow. But it seems to me that checking and converting seems about equivalent. There's kind of two basic ways of doing it. Uh, Zen, because Zen, Zen can read the end of the table, so it is able to tell where in the system physical address space um, the PMEM region will be, which means that, that Zen can actually tell when DOM0 maps something from the PMEM region. Uh, DOM0 can actually tell that that's happening. So uh, one option would be for Zen, DOM0 to, uh, sorry, Zen to keep track of all the, the places where um, the page tables are, are, are held. The other would be to, and then, go back and uh, find them when, when memory is promoted. The other option would be to do a brute force search of all of the DOM0 page tables uh, to find such mappings and either check them or promote them. Uh, none of these are actually very nice, uh, but I can't think of any other options. Uh, so we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, okay, so Zen needs a place to store its PMM for the Frank table. Uh, there's a couple different options. We could have the user manually set aside a namespace, just create a namespace, and then whenever, and then manually put into a config file somewhere, use this namespace for the frame table. Uh, a slightly better idea would be to create a, a custom UUI, type of UID for Zen. So then when you, you make a namespace, you, you designate it, this is for Zen to use for its purposes. And then when DOM0 boots, it just says, oh look, here's a namespace, it has the Zen frame table type, we'll just give the Zen without even asking. So that should be a lot easier. The other option would be to modify the Linux driver so that um, uh, just like just like Linux sets, a, sets aside space inside the namespace for itself to use for frame table, it could be configured to set aside um, space within the namespace for Zen to use for um, tables. Uh, these are all, there's no reason we can't do all of these. Um, there are different levels of just to progressively make things better. Um, right, so I think, yeah, so I think I'll we'll talk about this at the design section. Um, yes, okay. With regard to Zen and DOM use, uh, there's a couple issues. So one thing we, we, I, I think we want to aim for is guest compatibility. Okay, so PBH, as we've said, um, PBH is our next generation guest type. Um, I think we want to avoid using QMU to do NVDM inflation in, in um, emulation as much as possible. Okay, if we if we have, have QMU do emulation, then basically it's HBM only. Uh, so uh, as much as possible, we want to avoid using QMU for our, our guest type. Uh, I think to begin with, we just don't want to bother with virtual keyblock at all. Um, the virtual NVDMs. There's no reason to expose interleaved sets or any of this stuff. So just say you have one dim, 
um, and one labeled area. Uh, one of the issues we need to, to do is that if we're going to have labeled areas, which I think we do, then we have to have a separate space for labeled areas. Um, the basic um, two options here would be when you create the, the virtual NVDIM and the config file, you have two different specifications, one for where you're going to store the, the actual the, the DIM information, one for the labeled area. Um, the, I think eventually what we want to do is have a metadata format that says you have a single file or a single um, entity that contains within it that says, okay, this bit should be used for a label area, this bit should be used for um, the empty RAM. Uh, the next question is, okay, so if we have a guest, how are we going to be able to access the, the label areas? Um, one option, of course, would be to do some sort of emulation with QMU. I think one should avoid that. Um, PBH already has support for exposing things via ACPI, even without any kind of emulation. So one option would be to map the label areas into a secret area of the P2M, and then write some AML code, such that when the guest operating system executes the AML code, it will read and write these secret, secret areas of the P2M. The other option would be to, um, to have um, some hypercalls, right? Make a special PV interface that allows the, the guest operating system to just say, read and write this label area, and um, have that thing to like that. Okay. Um, I think I'm pretty close to being done, and those are all the main issues we need to issue. So are there any questions about this? Yes? I have two basic questions. I'm lost in all the background. First okay. is, how is clear how to access PMAP and PBLOCK? Perhaps with the examples from low-level instructions like uh, do we, for PMAM, do we directly read the memory address and the address is translated uh, MMU or is some different memory? I don't understand. So, um, so the idea of doing PMAM is you um, it, you access the memory in MV DIMs yeah, the, same, the, the, the same way you access the memory in your DIMs. Right, so so you have you have this thing called you have um uh, right, so you have page tables, okay, um, and you have a virtual address space, and in the page tables, page tables point to what's called system physical addresses, okay, so just physical address you put into the page table. Okay, okay. just to read it. That's it. You just read and write. Okay, that's right. <coughs> Um, so P block, I mean, normally an operating system would do this, um, but the way that you would do it is there's, um, there's a control region, and what you do is you, you write into the control region, I want to read, I want the control region, I want, I want to, to read data offset um, DPA, you know, 1000. You write that into there, and then there's a separate region called a, a, a data window. So the data window, is always at the same place in the system physical address space, but it points to different regions on the MVDIM. Does that make sense? So, um, if you want to read, if you want to read from here, you put the address into the control region, and now, uh, now if you read and write from this region, it will read and write this. <coughs> If you want to read up here, then you write the address, the, the, the DPA of this, into the control region, and then this will point to that region. Does that make sense? When the data is available, will we be notified of the interrupt? route? Oh, we need to actively pull in. I, I don't. I, I think you just write and then read. I, I think it's a bit like MMIO. but I'm, I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I interrupt quickly? So, do we have any in here, or is it going to stay? I'm oh, sorry, uh, are you saying that the talk is done? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're already in the question. Uh, okay.
<laughs> okay, we're going to have a design session. Um, check the website. It's going to be either this afternoon or tomorrow evening. Um, we can talk more about this. So.